Word, I'm gonna say the word. In the beginning was the word. What? Word. 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 Was the word. From the studios of KJZZ in Phoenix, Arizona, welcome to Word, a podcast about literature. Here's your host, Tom Maxidon. Coming up on this episode of Word, we have the winner of the 2024 KJZZ Haiku Writing Contest. This year, we wanted your haikus that answer the question, what's in store for 24? Our winner is Cindy Kuntz from Maricopa, Arizona. Yay! Oh my gosh, how exciting! Plus, spring training for baseball is underway now, but we'll take you back to a different era of the game and a Cinderella story from 100 years ago. The old gag line about Washington baseball was first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League. And then 1924, lo and behold, it went all the way. Also, we'll talk with NPR science correspondent Nell Greenfield-Boyce. She's got a new collection of essays, which is built around family anecdotes. You know, for NPR, I do a lot of straight reporting, but this kind of writing, personal essays, is very different. But first, E.A. Amar brings us a new crime novel that's got some humor peppered in. It's called When She Left, and it's a story of an affair gone rogue with a young couple who are forced to flee a family of criminals. This story is a little bit of a departure for me because traditionally my protagonists are women. And this is the first time I've written a book that has multiple POVs, but primarily male protagonists. Um, And I wanted to really write about how men react emotionally, even if they don't express it uh, through words, to losing something important to them. And in this case, three of the predominant male characters are losing, have lost, or in danger of losing uh, women that are close to them. So I wanted to really write about how how men react to that and what that looks like and how volatile their emotions can get. But also you do write from a female perspective, right, with some of these characters. Yeah, yeah, I've I've done that from day one. And I think that's because uh, my first book took a very uh, intense look at sex trafficking. And I did a lot of research in the in the field and talked to advocates and former uh, woman who had been trafficked. And it really gave me a bad taste for men. And I like being a man, but it was very hard for me to to write a book about that and have a man as the hero. Bouncing back and forth between those genders, what was the struggle like to do that? Because I can't believe that was easy. No, it's it's not. And you really want to make sure that you are not appropriating and you're not getting stuff wrong. All of my early readers are women. My uh, editor and my agent are both women. And these are very strong, outspoken women who uh, relish calling me out on the things I get wrong. That is great feedback. So I use that to inform these characters. But it also, it, in, as a writer, it sort of helps because I'm telling multiple stories. And in that way, you sort of never get bored. You know, there's one, if one character sort of feels like it's dragging, you're switching off to someone else. That's great. Yeah. And I'm curious about that process because did you approach it in a way that you were kind of writing like a series of short stories and you brought the whole novel together or did you map it all out at once? I map everything out. And it's funny that you mentioned that uh, because one of the, reviews I got for the first time where I did multiple POVs talked about um, how intricate the plot was. And I don't consider myself a very strong plotter. Uh, And primarily that's because I write in crime fiction and I'm next door to mysteries, which have terrifically complicated plots. Um, Thrillers, I don't think are as complicated um, because we're not, we're not concealing as much. So for me, writing these multiple POVs, I I lay out all their stories, and then I just figure out where they're going to intersect and how they're going to impact each other. I feel like I'm telling four different stories that intertwine, but comes off, I think, as more complex and intricate than it feels. When She Left centers on a 23-year-old Melissa Cruz who can't help falling in love with a kind of dreamy-eyed photographer whose name is Jake even if it means betraying her boyfriend, right, Chris? Yeah, and that was important for me because 
you know, as, as crime fiction writers, we don't often write about love, right? We write about its dissolution. Yeah. And I really wanted to write something that, that emphasize the importance of, of love and the reality of it and how genuine it can be. And for Melissa to leave her, her boyfriend off with somebody else, knowing full well the ramifications of that, her love and, and his love for her had to be real. And I really wanted to do something that reflected that. And how does that love turn into something nefarious involving crime? Well, that's the thing, right? Everything, every topic I approach is going to be written through the lens of crime fiction. That's, you know, my my love. That's my my field. It's it's mostly what I read. So it's going to be informed by that. And, you know, it's it's a bit everything within a book is exaggerated. May I ask if this main series of characters are based on real life experiences? Where do you draw your inspiration for this plot and folks who are involved in it? Well, for the realtor slash assassin, that's just a reality of the real estate business nowadays. Um, <laughs> with interest rates as high as they are, you need a second income. And if you can't do an Etsy store, it's, you know, contract killer. There's really no in between. No, that's not true. <laughs> well, I was going to say here in the Phoenix market, vulture capitalism is <laughs> omnipresent. So, Yeah, this book felt weirdly more personal to me. And I think that's because, you know, with writing crime fiction, you're writing about a circumstance that could happen. But in a lot of cases, it, it doesn't, fortunately. And for me to write a story then that, like I said, has exaggerations that are necessary for storytelling, but also remains grounded so that there is a reality, the emotions had to be real. I talked about the love earlier. And even for a character like Lucky, you know, when I was writing him, I was like, I want a character. I don't want a caricature. So realizing like, okay, here's what's grounding Lucky. It's what grounds me. It's his love to his family. And and that's something I resonated with. And then all of a sudden he became really true and also fun and funny to write because I could play off my own concerns about losing my family, which aren't fun. But, <laughs> you know, I was able to want to play them out with him. When She Left is the latest by E.A. Amar. I want to thank you so much for coming to Word and talking to us. It's an honor to be here, and I'll be at the Tucson Festival of Books. So I grew up in Arizona, and going back home is the best. You can find out a bit more about the upcoming Tucson Festival of Books and E.A. Amar on our website, word.kjzz.org. Coming up, spring training for baseball is underway now, but we'll take you back to a different era of the game and a Cinderella story from 100 years ago. I'm Tom Maxidon, and you're listening to Word, a KJZZ podcast about literature. In an era of behavioral health challenges, including addiction, there's a need for informed, compassionate providers. Rio Salado College is offering full scholarships in behavioral health programs. More information at riosalado.edu slash better tomorrow. My name is Ryan Lee. I think Hotspots is really cool that it was a tiny little curated list every week of just what's going on. I kind of discovered it at a time when I was looking around at what to do in the Phoenix area. Sign up for KJZZ's Hotspots, and once a week, we'll send you fun ideas for what to do when the weekend gets here. Visit hotspots.kjzz.org. On Morning Edition, you get a variety of interesting stories and conversations, deep dives, and breaking news. All available whenever you listen. On the patio, at the gym, in the car. The news is not always fun. But with Morning Edition on KJZZ, it is never boring. Listen every day from 5 until 9 on 91.5 at KJZZ.org. Welcome back to Word. I'm Tom Maxidon. Our next guest is now the author of three books about baseball. His latest was just released and takes readers back 100 years to a storied season with the 1924 Washington Senators, now known as the Washington Nationals, of course. The latest from Gary Sarnoff is titled Team of Destiny. I worked in corporation for a number of years, and I worked in baseball for a couple of years. I was in the front office for, for two different minor league teams. And then I decided I wanted to write because I've been reading about baseball history, sports history my whole life. 
I wanted to start sharing that with people, with other baseball fans like myself. So I decided to start to write about the history of baseball. Uh, this is my third book. I wrote two other baseball history books prior to this one. And then I decided to write this book about the 1924 Washington Senators team of destiny, a team that won the American League pennant and won the World Series. And the reason why I chose this team is I, I think this is a great story. I think this is one of baseball history's best stories. We'll get into the book here a bit deeper in just a sec. But first off, I kind of want to focus on what's been going on with respect to rule changes, specifically in 2022, with the timing between batters and pitches. Do you think those have been good or bad changes? I like the idea of speeding up the game. I think that's a pretty good idea to speed up the game, make them quicker because they were lasting awfully long. And it's hard when you have a family and you bring children to the game, it's hard for them to sit through the game. So I think speeding up the game was a good idea, but some of these other rule changes like, you know, the ghost runner and some of these others, I don't think it's good because I think it's best to leave baseball as is. Let them play the game. I'm always interested in talking about sports history in general because I find it funny sometimes when players from the past are compared to players of today in numerous statistical categories. I mean, there's so many different factors that might go into the level of play. I think it's hard to compare players from different eras. I mean, today's athlete is better. I mean, they're bigger, they're quicker, they're stronger. They could work all year round on baseball. I mean, you know, Back in the old days, baseball players worked two different jobs. After the season, they went to their other job, whether it was sales or whatever. So now, you know, baseball players, you know, they're paid so well that they could work on baseball all year around. You know, they could work out during the offseason and work on their game and work on fundamentals or whatever. So I can see why players are better today. But I think if you're going to compare players in different eras, you got to take a look at how dominant they were during their era, during their time. And I think that's how you measure them. Your book, Team of Destiny, Walter Johnson, Clark Griffith, Bucky Harris, and the 1924 Washington Senators does just this. Why did you want to write this story, if you will? Yes, it's history, but there's lots of story contained in this 100 years after this team. I think it's really a great, heartwarming, wonderful story. I mean, here you have the underdog Washington Senators, never came close to winning a pennant. Perennial losers uh, since they came into existence. Right after, shortly after the turn of the century, the old gag line about Washington baseball was first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League. <laughs> and that, that stuck with them for a long time. And then 1924, well, heading into the season, they were expected to be a, a loser. They were expected to have another losing season. They were expected to finish deep in the American League standings. And lo and behold, they went all the way. Uh, and I think something else that makes this a great story is Bucky Harris, the team manager, was hired. He was the starting second baseman. He was hired to manage the team at only age 27. He only had four full seasons of playing of major league playing experience. So here was a kid you know, to manage most of the players who were older than he was. You know, everyone laughed at Stolly Griffith was the team co-owner and president, and he made the decision to hire Harris, so they called it Griffith Stolly. Everybody laughed at it. <laughs> but I think above all, what makes this such a wonderful story is Walter Johnson. He broke into the major leagues in 1907. He pitched for the Senators. He was a great pitcher who had the misfortune of pitching for the Senators he was so great. And then in 1920, he sustained the only arm injury of his career. So following that arm injury, he had four mediocre seasons. Then in 1924, his arm was mysteriously restored to health. You know, he's pitching like the Walter Johnson of old. He was 36 years old. Most people before the 1924 season, most people thought he was washed up. And lo and behold, he wins 23 games. He wins the league's MVP award, and the Senators win the 1924 American League pennant. Some people say history repeats, but I'm more fond of saying history echoes. What do you think are some other echoes from this team in general, maybe into what's ahead for this baseball season? Well, with baseball, you just never know nowadays. If not this year, sometime in the near future, there will be a team like this that's not expected to do well and they kind of come out of nowhere and they contend and 
you know, they capture the imagination, the underdog capturing the imagination of baseball fans around the country, around the world. Uh, so, you know, I, I, it has happened since 1924, and I certainly think it'll happen in the future. But, you know, being in Washington, being a Nationals fan now, I certainly would love to see it happen to the 2024 Washington Nationals. I know a lot of folks in this region certainly are hoping that the Diamondbacks can make it back. Yeah, well, like I said, you never know about baseball. That's right. Gary Sarnoff yeah. is author of Team of Destiny, Walter Johnson, Clark Griffith, Bucky Harris, and the 1924 Washington Senators. It's out now. Gary, thank you so much for coming to Word. Thank you, Tom, for having me. You can find out a bit more about Gary Sarnoff on our website, word.kjzz.org. Coming up next, NPR science correspondent Nell Greenfield-Boyce joins us to talk about her new collection of essays. It's built around family anecdotes. I'm Tom Maxidon, and you're listening to Word, a KJZZ podcast about literature. Heart of the Arts is your connection to the exciting classical arts scene. I'm K-Box Greg Kustraba, and I interview some of today's top classical musicians, both here in the Valley and beyond. Subscribe to the podcast or listen on demand at heartofthearts.kbach.org to access these interviews. That's heartofthearts.kbach.org. Whether your business is new or deeply rooted, large or small, you can share what's great about it while supporting a vital community service, KJZZ. It's a fact that listeners trust and support companies that sponsor KJZZ. And by becoming a sponsor, you build a stronger connection to everyone in your community. Get connected today at SponsorKJZZ.org. Hey, it's Tiara. On All Things Considered, from KJZZ News and NPR, we hit pause on the news cycle for you, so you can get a handle on what you need to know and why it matters. Listen every afternoon from 3 until 6, on air, online, and on your phone. Welcome back to Word. I'm Tom Maxidon. Our final guest can be heard reporting science for NPR. Nell Greenfield Boyce has a new book which blends science and memoir with essays rooted in her family life. When we talked recently, I first wanted to know how she approaches science reporting for curious people who listen to NPR but might not have a wide background in that type of subject matter. Oh, that's not a problem. (laughs) Because science is something that I think a lot of people do have a certain amount of background in, whether it's school or mucking around in the woods or just observing things. I think that, you know, it is always possible to find some touchstone, something that you can use to sort of ground people into understanding what you're talking about. I mean, so many things that people have experience with in their life, you can use as metaphors, you can use as sort of like comparison things. And so I think that people are actually pretty um, informed about science, or at least scientific thinking. And, and I find it just wildly fun to talk about some of this stuff. I There's very rarely something where I think, wow, that's just like too complicated. We can't do that. Well, I love how you mix metaphor and observation and personal anecdotes in your new book, Transient and Strange Notes on the Science of Life. Like the opening chapter, for instance, you describe your son's interest in tornadoes and how one might depict such on TV. How did you come up with that approach for this book? (laughs) Well, I didn't really set out to write a book. I was writing some essays um, for a website that a friend of mine runs, and I um, found the whole thing much more interesting and engaging than I had anticipated. You know, for NPR, I do a lot of straight reporting, but this kind of writing, personal essays, is very different. And so that essay in particular about um, my son's phobia that he developed of tornadoes and just sort of trying to deal with that and trying to figure out, like, how to talk to him about tornadoes and the sort of threat of random abortion obliteration, which is a real threat. And like, what am I going to tell him? It's never going to happen. Like, I don't know that. But at the same time, it seems very (laughs) unlikely. Um, So, you know, as part of that, I got really interested in the history of tornado science. And I called up one of the nation's top tornado experts to talk to him about like, what does he think I should tell my kid? And so it just it turned out to be like a very curious and interesting way of uh, writing about things. And I, I found it super fun. And I hope people get something out of it. Well, and I like that process of discovery 
spun in the form of narrative, and you talked about it being different than what you do day to day for NPR. What was that process like? Because, I mean, in some ways you're using different parts of your brain, right? I find the same thing in my own career when I'm writing for news versus doing creative writing, for instance, like poetry. Yeah, I definitely think there's a an element of sort of letting your mind wander and daydream that that is a little bit different. Like, I'll give you an example. So there's another essay in this book about fleas, <laughs> which I, right. I wouldn't have thought that is something that I had many opinions or thoughts about. But uh, I was talking with my friend about um, Moby Dick. And there's a quote in Moby Dick where Herman Melville writes that, like, to have a, a great book, you must choose a great theme. You know, this is why he picked a whale, you know, a, a gargantuan animal. And he sort of says dismissively that no great and enduring volume could ever be written on the flea. And like my friend was like, oh, that sounds like a dare or a challenge or something. And I started thinking like, well, what what could you write about a flea? And it turns out fleas have a really potent symbolic power and they've been used as metaphors like throughout history for all kinds of things for the nature of the universe and you know they're the carriers of the plague and there's all sorts of weird romance stuff involving fleas it's just <laughs> it turned out to go in a lot of different directions that I I wouldn't have expected likewise and I love the historical aspect of these anecdotes and these personal essays and not only the animal realm with things like spiders and whales as you said but the human hearts How did you make your choices for those specific touchstones in this book? It's an interesting question how someone chooses something to write about. I mean, often there are little stories that just stick in your mind and you think about them and you start to add on to them. There was an example about an experience I had as a kid where, you know, I was sort of like talking with a much older guy and we were talking about black holes and thinking about like my own um, childhood and my own history and then thinking about the history of black hole science and the sort of metaphorical power of the black hole. You know, it was was an interesting experiment to kind of mix these things together, like mix the history of science with my own personal history to sort of see what would come out of it. And, you know, many times I, I also was surprised um, by what ended up there. So I, I, it's this curious process writing. It, it really is. You took me to a place in the last section that I certainly did not expect to travel as it's couched in the topic of eugenics and the anecdote that you use about kidneys. Talk to us a little bit about that and how delicate it was for you to approach that topic. Sure. You know, I've reported on the Human Genome Project and genetics um, basically my whole career. And I also have uh, an appreciation of the history of genetics, including some dark aspects of its history, uh, namely the eugenics movement, which I think a lot of Americans are not as aware as maybe they should be about this painful chapter in science and medicine and and the effect it had on um, many thousands of Americans. And so this essay is, is a story about me and my husband husband contemplating having kids and thinking about the various options we had to avoid passing on a gene that could cause uh, kidney disease, serious kidney disease. And it was very difficult for me to go through that process without reflecting on some of the connections between what happened in history and what people are faced with today when they have to make these, you know, very personal, very difficult decisions. And so, you know, it was a strange essay to write. It was very personal, obviously, but I I can only report on, on sort of what I experienced and my reflections, and people will make of it what they will. Nell Greenfield Boyce is author of Transient and Strange Notes on the Science of Life and, of course, a science correspondent for NPR. Nell, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You can find out a bit more about NPR's Nell Greenfield Boyce on our website, word.kjzz.org. All right, we've teased it long enough. And so it's time to officially announce the 2024 KJZZ Haiku Writing Contest winner. As a reminder, our theme this year was what's in store for 24. We received 270 submissions with answers to that question involving pretty dark political forecasts, honestly, hopes about graduation, upcoming travel plans, And, of course, Taylor Swift. Also, nature, just like our randomly selected winner, Cindy Kuntz, who incorporated such into her poem. I caught up with her recently on the phone to break the news. Hello? Hello, this is Tom Maxidon from KJZZ. I'm trying to reach Cindy. 
This is she. Hi, Cindy. Congratulations. You're the winner of the 2024 Haiku Writing Contest. Oh my gosh, how exciting! <laughs> well, thanks so much for entering the contest, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the inspiration for your poem. The inspiration is I'm a lifelong Arizona resident, and um, when I heard it on the radio, I just thought, wow, that is something I could really speak to. And so I was just very inspired, and I thought, I'm just going to take a second and write my thoughts down. Well, we're so glad that you did. Of course, the theme this year was what's in store for 24, and we got all types of responses, as you can imagine. Yes. Um, but yours happened to really focus on nature. I'm not sure if you have it committed to memory or if you could read it for us, if you needed a second to find it. You know what? I'll be honest. I wrote it at work, and this morning I'm at home, oh, no and worries. I don't... I don't actually have it with me right now. I'll read it for you then. Okay, okay, here it goes. The poem is called Sunny Arizona Vibes. Desert heat blazing. Cool staycations by the pool. Cacti sunglasses. One of the things that I love about it, and again, it's randomly selected, is I think a lot of people can really relate to it. How did you come up with the idea? You know, being from Arizona... I know a lot of tourists like to come here, so I do respect that I'm lucky enough to live in a place that is a, a destination for a lot of other people. And it's just the idea of, oh my gosh, you know how beautiful it is, even in the heat of the summer, just having our sunglasses on and, and relaxing by the pool and, and just what a dream it is uh, that we get to kind of live that life every day when a lot of people only can dream about it. So I just, you know, kind of thought about what it's like to live here in the summer and just the positive outlook that we have for this coming year. Cindy Coons from Maricopa, Arizona. Thanks so much for playing and for submitting your haiku to the 2024 KJZZ Haiku Writing Contest. Congratulations on being our winner. Thank you. Thanks to Cindy and everyone who submitted a haiku and to those of you who also support public radio as a sustaining member who makes monthly contributions. If you haven't had a chance to become one, that's okay. Now's the perfect time to make a gift of $5, 10 or maybe even $30 a month to fund fact-based journalism, in-depth analysis and conversation, as well as entertaining original programming like Word on KJZZ. Just go to KJZZ.org and click on the Donate tab. Per usual, we're on spring break for the month of March, but we're back in April with another series of entertaining and thought-provoking literary convos. I'm Tom Maxidon, and thanks so much for listening, as well as for supporting public radio. Word. Word? Word. Was the word. Thanks for listening to Word, a KJZZ podcast about literature. You can find all episodes online at word.kjzz.org or wherever you get your podcasts.